Can you please take a seat? So good morning and welcome to this uh, last panel discussion because we, before we move to the really important people uh, after lunch. Um, and um, we're going to come back to the issues uh, which, uh, which, which uh, we've discussed yesterday and this morning uh, and very much hope that we can also connect uh, what we've heard this morning on the, on the micro aspects of uh, price formation and wage formation and what we've uh, learned yesterday uh, on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on the macro uh, big picture. And so you're we're perfectly allowed to come back to uh, questions on the, on the Phillips curve, it's okay. Uh, can come back in the discussion. Um, and um, it's pretty much going to be about the same issues that we've already discussed, but I would very much uh, like to uh, uh, encourage the panelists and urge, urge the panelists to uh, uh, try as much as they can to, to distill the policy consequences, uh, because that's, that's what, uh, what we're here to discuss, uh, both at the micro level and at the macro level. Uh, um, uh, and also, uh, I would like to encourage the panelists as much as they can to focus on the uh, European dimension uh, of that discussion, uh, including possibly on the Eurozone dimension of that discussion, uh, given the uh, sequence we're in, uh, in terms of uh, uh, decisions on the, on the future of the Eurozone. Uh, and there is a lot to say about the uh, importance of labor markets and wages also uh, in, uh, in uh, yours on adjustment. So if, if that dimension can come up in the discussion, that can be very useful uh, for us uh, as, uh, as policymakers. Um, uh, I'm going to be tough on time, uh, but we have a, a good uh, incentive structure, I guess, because uh, next item is the lunch. Uh, and so uh, all uh, stakeholders here uh, have an interest in uh, disciplining the panel uh, so that uh, we don't steal uh, too much time out of the lunch. Uh, so um, let's uh, let's start the initial presentation. Erika, uh, uh, welcome. The floor is yours. Great. Well, uh, thank you to the organizers certainly for um, including me here today, and it's a pleasure to be back in the central banking community where I spent most of my professional life. But as many of you know, that uh, for the last four years until 2017, I was uh, head of the Bureau of Labor Statistics. <laughs> so what I want to talk about today is central bankers and national statisticians. Um, and I want to uh, uh, talk about some of the things that I learned as being head of the BLS that I think are very relevant to central bankers. And uh, you see this picture here of uh, Cristiano Ronaldo uh, confronting problems with imperfect statistics. That's <laughs> <laughs> butting up his head there. And, uh, I figured that this, um, he may not know that that's uh, what was frustrating him, but we do. Um, so I'm going to go from there and talk about some uh, price index measurement challenges and then talk about uh, improvement opportunity, opportunities and challenges, and I think of them very much as part of central bank policy. Okay? So let me start off by saying, well, what is the, the natural, the appropriate relationship between central bankers and national statisticians? Well, there's certainly the client and provider relationship that we think of immediately that uh, central banks are uh, very important providers, or rather clients, of, uh, of the national statistical system. But of course, they're also very much professional peers, that uh, the, uh, the expertise, the, uh, the professionalism of both central banks and national statistical offices makes them natural uh, colleagues in dealing with issues. Uh, they have very compatible missions. First of all, their overall mission to broadly support national welfare is very consistent. Uh, but their particular missions are quite distinct. They really should be, as, um, as President Draghi reminded us yesterday, they really need to be independent of each other in order to preserve their credibility. Right. That's very important. Um, 
But this independence, uh, the independence is important both in reality and because of optics, right? But this independence shouldn't mean uh, abdicating support for each other. And that, I think, is an important issue. So let me, I'll, I'll return to that in a minute. Well, let me talk a little bit about the goals of a national, uh, of a statistical um, agency. Um, and, I, and remember, I put here in the trenches because the important thing to realize is just as central banking has a nitty gritty aspect to it and imperfections involved in what it does, that's very much the case for statistical offices. So the goals are obviously the best possible official statistics to guide decisions. So why do we have statistical agencies? Sometimes those of us who are data nerds forget why it is we love statistics, but it is because it empowers us to make good decisions and it empowers everybody in the economy to make good decisions, not just central bankers. And what are, what's good data? Five characteristics, accurate, objective, Relevant, timely, accessible. Okay, we can, I can go into those in great detail, but I think you all understand what they mean. Uh, this, though, has to be subject to very real constraints, resource constraints, putting out the data within a time frame uh, so that it can be timely. So when we're talking about the CPI, from collection to production, 20 days, right? And you have to do that every month. Um, you have to preserve respondent confidentiality. You have to avoid undue burden so that you keep response rates up. And because of that, you make changes only when you're certain that they will improve accuracy significantly. Right. All right. So that's the world in which the statistical agencies operate. So when a uh, economic phenomena is noticed, comes up. A very important question to ask is, is this real or is it a data artifact? And certainly no national statistician would argue against asking that question when, when uh, the phenomena occurs. Um, but there is a slight difference in approach to this because the central bankers and the researchers will think of this often as a new question, something they haven't run into before. And they'll say, oh, this really demands attention and resources and let's throw them at the question. All right. Whereas the statistical agencies, by and large, have been dealing with these questions for, uh, since they created the statistics in is at issue. All right. So very often, these issues that are brought up are an acknowledged limitation of statistics, because all statistics have limitations, and have been the subject of ongoing improvements of research and institutional memory. So there's a little bit of difference, one group saying, wow, and the other group saying, again? <laughs> you know? uh, that's the world in which they deal with, uh, they deal with each other, but joining then joining forces can be amazingly productive because the national statisticians bring in this institutional memory, this experience, this understanding, and the, um, the researchers, the central bankers have this energy and this focus on it. So uh, with that in mind, let's talk about price index measurement challenges. I'm gonna focus uh, two, on two issues that just came up recently. Um, that have been raised e recently. One is uh, new goods and quality adjustment bias, and the other is substitution. So when you're talking about innovation in price indexes, I'm really going to run through this. You know, the basic, uh, the basic uh, approach is to try and match products over time, and to the so the the more uh, closely you can match products over time, the more you can attribute any price change to inflation. That's the basic idea. And this gives you an idea from one year of the, the CPI that um, in that year, only 2%, that yellow piece there, of the prices in the CPI were, um, were cases where quality adjustments were needed. So by and large, price matching really works, but we do need to do quality adjustments some of the time. There are uh, here three ways that quality adjustments are done. 
producer provided quality adjustments. That's more on the PPI and import export prices. Input from other surveys is another source. And then there are hedonic adjustments. Uh, CPI uses a lot of that, and housing is a very big part of that. So, um, but some quality adjustment and new goods bias remains. Uh, BLS is always kind of playing catch up on all of this. And a recent paper that uh, four co-authors and I uh, put out in, uh, in, um, in uh, 2017, April 2017, in the JEP, tries to estimate how much that is. We come up with an estimate of a uh, bias on real GDP of four-tenths of a percentage point from this bias. We find that um, there's been little change in this over time. It's real, it's there, little change over time. It's mostly not about the digital economy, it's mostly about healthcare, okay? Uh, and it looms larger when, uh, obviously, when growth is slow, then, then this is a larger part of what you're seeing. From the BLS and BEA perspective, uh, nobody there was actually really alarmed at this, but neither were they satisfied, okay? It, it has helped to focus uh, efforts. So if you're interested in this, I, I would uh, point you to that paper. All right, substitution bias. This has also been a long time concern. On average, it causes uh, overestimation of cost of living increases. To, so to the extent that you want to uh, measure cost of living changes, you get that. Um, there have been ongoing improvements in the CPI to deal with this. And then there's been the introduction of the change CPI to really try and address the um, uh, substitution bias, and that has a, a, a monthly changing market basket, and it also uses the Tornquist uh, formula to allow for more, subs uh, to control for substitution bias. So just to give you an idea of whether that is getting worse or better, you can compare the CPI to the chained CPI, and this uh, blue line uh, is the, uh, is the difference in the 12 month, it's a rolling average difference in the 12 month CPI and chain CPI from the inception of the chain CPI 2000 up to 2017. And then I've drawn in the red line, just uh, you know, divided the sample in half and said, what's, what's the difference? And if anything, the substitution bias seems to be decreasing. Okay. So, let me push right ahead because I am running out of time. Oops, I've already run out of time. Okay, so improvement opportunities and challenges. Many opportunities, uh, there's progress being made. Uh, this gives you an example of places where progress is being made within the BLS and BEA. Um, opportunities. Uh, the main opportunities that I wanna call your attention to are uses of alternative data. And there are really quite a few uh, alternative data sources that are being tapped within, uh, for the statistical agencies. Uh, I list here some of them, but I think it's very important to realize that none of the sources is free, uh, riskless, or clean. So it actually takes resources to begin to tap into these things. Research is required, comparisons, because these data are so important to so many decisions, you can't go about uh, carelessly changing. Okay. Uh, there are also some very important, interesting uh, issues that can be looked at. Um, the role of margins in inflation, I think, is very interesting. The new producer price index system calls out uh, and, and provides estimates on margins, Clearly, the, the PPI trade services margins. Uh, I often got complaints about what was this thing doing? It's large, it's volatile. And I think the answer is a group of, of uh, central bankers and or researchers can probably now that there's a series long enough, can probably now begin to understand what these margins are doing. And so I encourage somebody to, uh, to take that up. Uh, another question is work hours. We don't measure and understand work hours very well. I think that there's a lot of room for tracking and understanding work hours. And then a big, very, a big topic is that I think has been under-researched uh, under uh, and that the statistical agencies should 
uh, be funded to delve into more carefully is are our wage indexes. In the US, we have the, um, the average hourly earnings, which has a, um, uh, for which there's a lot of item non-response, so it's smoothed a lot. It's not uh, as good as you might want it to be. And there's the employment cost index, which is composi composition adjusted. It's a good measure, but it's only quarterly. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities, I think, for improving our compensation, not just wages, but compensation measures. Uh, Erica, you, you really need to conclude. And now oh, no, I'm really over. OK. So conclusion, uh, let's see, OK. Uh, all right, so we have many improvement challenges. The main thing I want to say here is that there is a role for the central banks to support their statistical agencies. That's very important. Um, what kind of support do I mean? I mean support. We now have, uh, we have statistical agencies under attack for their integrity. Central banks need to speak up for the integrity of the central of, of the statistical agencies. This is happening uh, certainly in Puerto Rico and in the U.S., but also in Greece, where the former central banker is, uh, has been convicted of the crime of publishing accurate GDP statistics, <laughs> right? and, um, and many other countries where uh, the statistical agencies are underfunded. And then, of course, they're standing up for the integrity of the data. That's hugely important. So let me stop now because I'm over. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Erica. We, we can come back to any issue in the, in the discussion. We'll have plenty of time to, uh, to discuss. And on the, on, in the case of Greece, I would like to, by the way, to confirm that, the, uh, that upholding the uh, independence and integrity of uh, independent agencies, and in particular of the statistical um, production process in Greece, has been a priority of the European institutions uh, and remains a priority uh, and uh, that will also be on the table uh, in the Eurogroup discussion uh, tomorrow. Uh, Philippe, the floor is yours. So, hello, everybody. I'm pleased to be uh, with you. So, I am uh, from the ILO, International Labour Organization. We don't used to be invited in a central bank meeting. I'm not an academic. Well, I asked twice. Are you sure that you? <laughs> Okay, so I will come back on some of the issues we, we, we listened this morning in particular, maybe <coughs> about more general trends, and I will have only four slides, because I will try to, st to stick to my uh, 10 minutes. So the first is figures that we already... Yep. Voilà. The first figure that has to, something to do with what we, we see this morning, uh, compare the, the evolution of labor productivity and uh, wages in advanced economy. Huh? So the data are from 1999 until 2017 for the group of the 36 developed economies. Here, instead of hourly wages, figure as the paper presented in this morning, we use the more widely available mostly wages and consistently on measure of productivity in GDP per worker. We also deflate, as it has been done this morning, by the CPI and GDP deflator, and we observe the same tendencies that with the GDP deflator, <coughs> the gap with labor productivity is smaller. But in any case, the conclusion is the same. We, we see a decoupling between wage growth and productivity growth among the country. We also see that this is not a recent phenomenon. It is a, a, a long-term trend that <coughs> has led to the decline of labor share in a majority of countries in the world, in a majority of developed economy too. In this chart, index real wage index labor productivity are weighted average. So this means that big country influence the figure more than small countries. And the figure, figure is very driven by U.S., Germany, and Japan. In reality, of course, you have a diversity of situation across countries. We, see, we listened this morning about France. You can say the same with 
Italy, where you have uh, productivity growth and wages going together, but productivity is not increasing. This is what we observe. Now, I move to, the sec to a second slide. Voilà, okay. We, as it has been said, I think it is very important not to approach wage dynamic only by looking at average, uh, <coughs> but also the distribution. The, the sentil and the style of the wage distribution experience different evolution a long time, and our calculation and OECD calculation arrive to the same conclusion that wage inequality has increased in developed economy. Obviously, this has important implications because, as we know, High wage earners have a higher propensity to save than middle class and low uh, pay workers. So if average wage grows only from the, uh, an increase in the top distribution, the effect on aggregate demand and eventually on price might be less than if it is a broad-based broad wage increase that benefit middle class and low paid workers. To illustrate the extent of wage inequality in Europe, so I try to stick to Europe, <laughs> we produce these 3D figures when we rank enterprise in the horizontal axis according to their average wage. We rank uh, the workers according to their wa annual uh, hourly wage in the, in the in-depth axis. And on the vertical axis, we rank, we illustrate the level of the wage we are speaking about. And what we see in these in this figures that you have in Europe a lot of workers that are paid less than 20 euros per hour. <coughs> and these are mostly, not in every country, but mostly the workers for which which are stagnated. stagnated. The part on, on the <coughs> upper <coughs> right side corner of the figure has tended to increase more. <coughs> Some recent studies have emphasized the need to reduce inequality between enterprises, but our figure shows that inequality within enterprise is also uh, very important. And according to our calculation, close to 80% of workers earn less than the average wage in the enterprise in which they work. And within wage inequality count for 42% of total wage inequality in Europe, so it's not ridiculous. This means that reducing wage inequality within enterprise require, is part of the policy response to wage inequality and the possible impact. Now I will move toward two labor market institutions. I will uh, look now <coughs> first the contractual arrangement. So over, over the past decade, uh, part-time work and fixed-term contract have been increasing in Europe. Part of this increase is conjunctural. We look at the figure of Spain, for example. But we see that there is a structural tendency to have an increase of this form of employment. And we expect that technological change will further diversify employment patterns in the future. There is a, a, a range of legal instruments that set equal treatment and equal pay for workers in all forms of contractual arrangement, including international labor standards and EU directive. But in practice, as we see in the graph, temporary employment controlling by the characteristic of the worker and characteristic of the job are suffering wage penalty. Sometimes part-time employment Feature premium, but that is rarely the case in Europe. In Europe also, part-time employment is associated with wage penalty. And I think we listened something about that this morning. Working worker in temporary employment, multi-party employment relationship, and out call work have little participation in trade unions. They are less member. And more broadly, their bargaining power tend to be lower than standard workers for multiple reasons, including fear of retaliation, sometimes diverging interests with standard workers, lack of awareness of rights. So, and this is very controversial. There is also from part of the trade union movement the feeling that non-standard workers are used not only to lower their bargaining power as them, but to lower the bargaining power of trade unions uh, 
but I will not enter in that, you know. <laughs> So non-standard form of employment can help enterprise to adapt to the demand in the labor market, contributing to uh, sustainability of enterprise and growth. But what, so we are not for to get rid of this form of employment, but we want in the ILO to ensure that these jobs are good jobs, <coughs> where workers have earnings that are predictable and in line with equal pay for work of equal value. Now, I will look at another labor market institution, trade union and collective bargaining, that have also a strong influence on wages, as we listened this morning, but as we know. This shows the evolution of trade union density and collective bargaining coverage in Europe from 2000 to until 2016. So it's quite amazing because we see that only two countries experience an increase in collective bargaining coverage during this period, for EU28, the decrease is of more than 20%, so significant. And all countries, with very few exceptions, experience a decline in trade union density from more than 10%, <coughs> with extreme cases such as Lotia, Estonia, or Slovakia, where the decline is of more than 50%. So it is, <coughs> despite a general discourse, and that they used to listen in the European Commission, for example, about how important is social dialogue and uh, collective bargaining, we observe an erosion of trade union density and collective bargaining, bargaining coverage in Europe that is relatively strong. <coughs> and I would say that often what we observe, it was not the case in, in, in Germany, no, not too much a case in Germany, but often public policies are at the origin of the declining coverage of collective bargaining. So to conclude, so there are uh, different reasons, and uh, we listen some about real wage stagnation. Sometimes it's only a problem of low productivity growth, or sometimes it's a problem of decoupling. <coughs> and we ILO, we focus on the evolution of labor market institution in this area, that weakened the bargaining power of workers because we suspect we didn't quantify yet that this has implication in terms of wage level. I just want to conclude by saying that I am convinced that the decline in the collective bargaining coverage that we observe is not an inevitable consequence of the changing world of work. I think history has demonstrated that collective bargaining has the flexibility and adaptability required to face change. For me, but it's up to the social partner to say, the big challenge is to have modality of employer and worker organization and of collective bargaining that are more inclusive among a diversity of working workers in different forms of employment, including the new forms that emerge in the digital economy. I will also say that collective bargaining to be strong need good public policy or favorable public policy. And I think there is a lack still of research to understand better how different collective bargaining arrangements can contribute to both equity and performance in the labor market. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Philippe. Uh, I mean, your slide on the decline of, uh, of uh, union coverage and, and collective bargaining is absolutely striking. I guess one obvious question, you can store it and, and answer later, but one obvious question is how the change relates to the level. Uh, focusing on France, for instance, uh, the, the change was limited, but it starts from, from a very low level. So one, one other way to ask, to ask the same question is, do we see convergence across Europe uh, in terms of industrial relations or, or, or divergence, uh, which matters also for the functioning uh, of, the, of the region. But that's for later. Uh, Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me on this um, uh, panel. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm an IO economist. I'm currently working for the European A Commission Competition Watchdog, so I want to give you a, a sort of antitrust uh, a perspective on markets. 
uh, competition authorities, what they do, they try to prevent prices from going up. So I understand in this conference a puzzle is, what, is why we don't see uh, inflation going up. So I think uh, I solved the puzzle. We can go for lunch. It's because of the job we do. I wish it was that, that, it, uh, that simple. So uh, being more serious now, I will give you some ideas about concentration matters. Um, the debate started uh, a couple of years ago in the US, so this is, but I will present European data. So uh, in the US there is some evidence that uh, market concentration is going up. What this figure is doing is looking at the change in a concentration index, HHI, and in some industries this change is very substantial. So in 80% of US industries, concentration has been going up between 1997 and 2014. So that's a, that's a large change. Another picture that uh, seen is on mark caps and margins. This is from the paper of Jan Eckhout and Jan Deleuker. You see that from the 80s something changed and margins, so the ability of firms to price above cost. There is, there is a, a big debate on what is the notion of cost, but the ability of, of firms to price um, above cost has increased. Margins are on the rise. So what's happening instead in Europe? First uh, thing to say is that some companies are actually global, so whatever is valid for the US would be valid for Europe too, because we belong to the same global market. But instead, we started some, so the, a problem with Europe is that there is less uh, systematic data collection. We are trying to improve. So at the Commission, we have an ongoing project. By the end of the summer, we will have a time series of 20, 25 years. This is just to, to give you a flavor of it. This is just over six years. Concentration in Europe has been pretty stable, so not lots of dynamics. Here you see the five largest economies in the EU plus uh, the aggregate EU. Um, the, 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 um, the picture is rather static. Uh, at the industry level, some regularities start emerging, so there is huge differences across industries. Regularity here is that you will see that the really concentrated uh, industries, in the, according to all different measures, are telecoms, uh, transport, manufacturing, and finance. Within each industry, there will be heterogeneity, because when I say uh, ITC, there will be fixed telecom, mobile telecom, semiconductors, computers, so it will be different things. We have to be a bit more precise. Uh, another thing, as you start digging, deeper into industries, you will see that in Europe, many of these markets are still largely national. So, so we don't really have a single market. We don't have a lot of integration. So it's really telecoms in Italy are telecoms in Italy. Uh, telecoms in Spain are telecoms in Spain, and so forth. So we don't have a single market. Uh, margins, that's really where something valid, maybe across the board, starts emerging. So this is our own data on European margins, and they are compared with the US. And you see, apart from uh, striking differences after the recession, and Europe, it took much longer, but, but, but if you look at the trends, they are actually quite similar. So margins are on the rise. So in, in a sense, a takeaway of some of this uh, uh, literature is that no matter what uh, uh, method you employ, so Jan, for instance, is, is doing data at the firm level and they estimate production function. This is instead from national accounts. These people using accounting data in different ways. This seems to be irregularity. So this seems to be irregularity. Having said that, don't be too excited. This is the European picture of the five largest economies. And the picture is driven by Germany, France, and the UK to some extent. Italy and Spain, now they are recovering margin, but they really suffered after the a financial crisis, and margins dropped to, to, to very low levels. But they are picking, picking up again. So what are the implications for us, for you? Because we have slightly different perspectives on this. Uh, the first imp implication as an economist, I would say, if concentration goes up, you would expect prices to go up and quantities to go down Cheddar is paribus, all else equal. Then we can discuss whether everything else is indeed equal. So these are two things, prices going up, but also quantities. So when you measure your inflation, et cetera, of having fixed baskets may, 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 may be capturing only one aspect and not the whole picture. So quantities do matter. Another implication for 
um, a, a crowd like this one is that to the extent that market power is a substantial feature of the aggregate economy, it needs to be factored in in our models. And I'm sure you're already doing this. So I'm not familiar with the way you do macro models, but just think of my thoughts as something that maybe you're already doing. That's fine. But if not, try to see how you may have to change a few things. So account for markups. But these markups are not constant over time. They're not constant across industries. To have some kind of simple monopo uh, monopolistic and competition models may not be exactly the way to go. You may have to adjust it. I said this is the, the, the prediction, the simplest uh, microeconomics per uh, perspective, prices on the increase and quantities on the decrease. Ceteris paribus. So what may have changed, and this is interesting about margins going up everywhere, is that there seems to be a, a common substantial technological change going on. So the cost function of firms seems to have changed. There are more economies of scale, say, to simplify higher fixed cost and lower marginal cost. This implies that it's easy to, to show that you will have less entry, the few firms in the markets will have higher markups, and prices may or may not go down according to how the, 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 the market power is, is compensated by cheaper cost, cheaper marginal cost. Um, the, the, the consequence of this is also that will be less entry. So one of the big worries from, from a, a policy a perspective, we have evidence from the US, we start having evidence in uh, Europe every year, firms you know, are born and firms die. So these uh, entry and exit dynamics are, su are super important. On the exit di dynamics, we are more or less on the same historical trends. So firms die now as they used to die in the past. Instead, firms don't seem to be to born as much as in the past. So we don't have these uh, dynamics, these healthy dynamics that we, 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 we had in the, in the past. So some imp implication also for you, and this I'm repeating something that already Aviv said, um, the the pass-through is related to market power, so think about the effectiveness of some of your monetary aid transmission mechanisms. Uh, under some conditions, going from competition, high pass-through to, to less competition should reduce the pass-through. So this is a general theme, the, the, the responsiveness of firms changes. This means that monetary uh, transmission will be affected, but in general, Responses to shocks will be, will be affected, can be responsive to shocks in, uh, in the labor markets, could be responsive to entry and exit. So we might have less dynamism, question mark, I don't know, this is really a conjecture. Um, you should also think sometimes, maybe you're, you're already doing that in your models, of the vertical structure, there's upstream and downstream. In the kind of concentrations I'm observing at the commission, there's lots of boring stuff, but essential stuff. So market power being acquired over cement, over titanium dioxide, raw materials, and you name it. But these will be used by a lot of industries. And if these industries themselves have market power, what you would ex expect on the final prices would be, would be, would be different. This is not a general result, though. Aviv mentioned, I think, tobacco, and tobacco is said this is an industry where the pass-through is higher than 100%. I would say it's a more general feature of some industries where, say, a must-have goods, industries where demand is very convex. We don't have to be technical, but the price goes up. People still want to buy pretty much as much as what they were buying before. So when demand is very convex, actually... The more uh, market power, power you, you have, uh, the, the higher the pass-through uh, will be. So when you're doing your studies, think about the composition of industries. There is lots of heterogeneity there. In most sectors, consumer goods, I would conjecture uh, monetary policy to be less effective, because what I said, the, the pass-through bill will be, will be lower. But on these essential goods, not only tobacco, but can be transport, energy, they actually, actually the other way around could also be a possibility. Um, and finally, I have my last minute when I want to talk a little bit about, about digitization. So GAFA, this Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple. So um, these are three of these companies will be uh, reaching $1 trillion of market capitalization soon. So do they have any, an, an impact in the economy? Yes, of course. Uh, but not as large as you might expect in aggregate. Um, we heard this morning that all the digital staff uh, uh, Eric has said uh, it's being measured, which is great. There is, uh, um, but just to give you a, a perspective, is it market power going to increase the prices or are, is the super efficiency of these uh, superstar firms going to compensate for it? 
So using a typical merger simulation model we use at the commission to simplify, if you have quite a big concentration from three to two, so three major players to two under some assumption, typically the, the prices would increase substantially by 10% if costs were equal. And because they acquire market power, the decrease in marginal costs need to be more than one for one. The decrease in marginal costs would need to be of the range of 16%. So just as, as an order, just as a, favor, a flavor of what's going on, are these kind of efficiencies what we're observing in the data that could justify the facts that prices don't go up despite market power? Uh, Finally, um, a debate which is more on the Google side. Uh, we are paying with our data, so we because ser ser uh, search is free or Facebook, uh, we, 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 we don't need to pay a subscription, a, a subscription fee because then these, these guys get to know a lot about us and then they do targeted advertising, so are we not measuring prices right? Here, I would say prima facie, we are already measuring prices in the sense that all this information is, is then used to do targeted advertising. This feeds into the production function and the cost function of those firms which are interested to advertise online. So to the extent that these costs are already uh, imp imputed uh, in our measures, then we should not do double counting because we are already to the extent that indeed the advertising costs are something that you monitor. I'm going to finish here. Thank you very much. So the last speaker is Klaus Zimmermann. And we're hopping back from product markets to labor markets. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I uh, have no slides, so you can see me everywhere. But, uh, also, I think that it's much, much easier to interact with uh, the policy issues uh, when you have no uh, structure. Uh, post on yourself, so you have more flexible. Now, uh, what we learned, what we have to do in a panel is uh, is to find out what uh, what uh, is the policy uh, implication of what we have heard so far on the day. So we have somehow to review what what goes on, and I will certainly focus more on wages than on prices. Now we found out, uh, as one uh, um, uh, finding is that uh, shopping is exciting even without inflation. We also learned that nice unions uh, uh, do it all, at least, at least as long as they exist. And uh, uh, these are uh, uh, some provocative uh, positions already. Now, uh, when I wrote 40 years ago my diploma thesis on rational expectations and the Phillips curves, well, uh, inflation was money, yes? And, uh, well, the Phillips curve was not really existing anymore. Yes, because of rational expectations. Nowadays, it's completely back. We are back, so to speak. The Phillips curve exists, and while well, money is not really relevant. Yes, at least uh, I haven't heard much about money uh, the two days. Uh, but still, I mean, uh, uh, a simple formula of, of that time is, 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 is helpful. Also explain why labor economists are here. We are here. We have a reason to be here. Uh, well, if the labor share is constant, what many of you are doubting, yes, then inflation is nothing more than the difference between wage growth and labor productivity growth. Yes, that's a simple uh, tautological reformulation. So, well, wage growth and labor productivity, these are labor issues, yes. It's only this issue of reducing uh, the labor share, which is maybe not fully labor, but uh, okay. So uh, we, in, in a way, have a reason to be here, and uh, um, uh, central banks can learn, I guess, something from the work we are doing also on the micro level. Now, the first issue now is why are we concerned? Because when I was invited, was, uh, we are concerned about wage, uh, wages. Uh, wages are not rising enough. Yes, it needs Jens uh, the Weidmann in Germany uh, to push for higher wages, not the unions. Yes, Jens Weidmann for years pushes for higher wages in, in Germany. So really, this is a concern. Why is this really a concern? Now, well, wages are prices, and uh, prices uh, uh, have signals, uh, and signals are important. Even if wages would not have to rise, yes, uh, some of the wages uh, in general, but some of the wages have to go up, others have to go down uh, to signal change changes in structural developments in the economy to reallocate. And, uh, well, what we also know from research of uh, 
economists, and one of them, uh, one of those is here even. Uh, well, one, one of those is, is Truman Bewley, uh, who had written years ago um, a, a book and later also articles on it. Why, uh, why there, are, there are no cut wage cuts? Yes, wages are never go down. Wages are all with go up. Uh, if all stays the same. And this has a lot of psychological reasons. So if you want to see signals, wages have to grow because some wages can grow a little bit more, others can grow a little bit less, yes? So to, to, to provide uh, the information. This is already one argument. There are many other arguments why wages should go up, but that's at least uh, uh, from the start something what is very important, very central to the market um, uh, economy. Now, um, the question is, of course, what, what are wages? Yes, uh, well, like, this is the same debate on what, what are prices, yes? Uh, uh, somehow labor costs or labor, or labor income is divided to some kind of human index, yes? Some, 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 some take heads, others take hours, uh, but uh, well, if you think about labor hoarding, uh, robots, and, and all kinds of changes, uh, working overtime, unpaid, lay, unpaid work, and all these kind of issues, uh, it's not, not an easy concept. So looking at wages and to see why some countries behave different, or some regions behave different, some sector, sectors behave different, it's very important to see the institutional backgrounds uh, to understand what's, what's behind. And now, um, uh, yeah, the question is, of course, what determines wage growth? And we are a little bit puzzled, and we learned, not only here, but uh, also here, that the, uh, the Phillips curve, whether with inflation on the left-hand side or with, with wage growth at the left-hand side, is flattening uh, at the moment, and substantially flattening, and there's puzzling about it. And the question is, with falling unemployment, Rates, the, 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 the issue is the challenge issue. Will unemployment, can unemployment fall so low, let's say in Germany or in the UK or in the United States, that if, if prices would have to, to, to explode? And uh, well, we had um, uh, first we have to realize, and there's the work we have seen by, uh, by, by Stock and by Schoenberg uh, yesterday and today is that uh, there's, there's evidence for flattening of the. Um, uh, of the Phillips curve. There's also work by uh, David Bell and David Blanchflower, recently very fresh new papers. They are arguing that the issue with uh, the unemployment rate has very much to do in the after the recession with the way uh, how unemployment measures the underutilization of labor. Uh, so what we don't measure is that people would like to work more. Uh, or previously would have liked to work less, but no longer do so. So they show that people working uh, are not working enough, in their own opinion, and others who in the past have thought they worked too much, they worked too much or work, uh, wanted to work, uh, no longer want to work less. So there is an underutilization of work, and if you, if you bring this into the, reg into the regressions, you find much more stable results. Also, the general finding uh, they show is uh, that we are still uh, flattening. Um, however, they also point at an interesting debate between uh, Keynes and, and uh, Beveridge, uh, who, uh, well, Beveridge already in 1944 was predicting uh, a low uh, unemployment rate, and um, uh, Keynes was very uh, uh, unsure that this could be could happening, that 3% is very, very low. Now, in 1960, Bewley reflected backwards, arguing, well, I was not so wrong. And by the way, between 1948 and 1959, in the United Kingdom, the average unemployment rate was 1.5% without prices exploding. So the idea is maybe we should not be so much concerned about uh, that issue, that challenge. Uh, in, in general. Now, of course, uh, many factors determining wage growth and explain differences across countries. Uh, uh, there are measures, uh, scarcity is, of course, an important issue, productivity changes, uh, of course, price expectations, but no longer at the moment. Uh, uh, we are now back to past inflation as a predictor of uh, unemployment uh, expect uh, price expectations. This was, was once defeated 40 years ago as wrong. Um, and we have, we have, of course, growth expectations driving the issues, future labor markets. 
well, if robots will really do what we expect, or some people expect from them, then uh, we will have large stocks of labor in the future underemployed at work, if they cannot be fired, underemployed at work, which is uh, a prediction then that wages out in the future will be low. However, uh, what I also haven't heard much in this conference so far is migration uh, is helping also uh, to uh, influence uh, not only wage changes, but also to, uh, to, to, to make wages just smoother across areas. There is research done by saying that in particular in the country of the European, uh, of the Euro, in the Eurozone, uh, uh, the adjustments across countries to, to asymmetric jobs have, have, have increased which is what we want. And this implicitly, of course, says also that wages uh, would, 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 would smooth uh, uh, down. OK, now, um, the last point I would like uh, to, to comment on is, is on Germany. Um, rightly, uh, we have now heard a nice paper and a nice discussion of uh, that paper, uh, uh, which also concentrates on why Germany is different. And I agree with many of the particular, of course, the empirical facts are very well uh, elaborated. The question is interpretation. Um, the question is interpretation. I'm a little bit more doubtful that um, this was all done by reunions who like uh, uh, to save uh, the German economy. If one has be part of the, of the heavy debate uh, ongoing about what is right or wrong, one can have different opinions on this. Uh, but, but one, then one has to smell that must be more on it. So, so for instance, the, the, the internal, it's true that there huge, is a huge internal flexibility. Uh, uh, have been achieved, and others, including myself and co authors, have also worked on that issue, but without uh, a long term pressure on uh, reforms and changes, um, uh, these kind of changes uh, would not have been taken. Uh, Place. Also, there were lots of government interventions. So the labor hoarding uh, in the Great Recession by the, organized by the German government was also a measure of internal flexibility. So the, uh, also, uh, it's true that more and more companies no longer follow uh, the uh, union wages. However, theoretically, it's possible. Every ministry, the federal ministry, but also the state ministry for labor, have a commission where uh, one of the social partners can apply for uh, a generalization of the wage contract. It's true that it is no longer done so much, and the question is why. Yes, I mean, there is, there is a, a debate. So, so uh, also unions behave in a way uh, which uh, also the German unions, yes, have to follow interests. Yes, in the long term, they have to also think about wages. They decided to, 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 to bargain for, for jobs, uh, but uh, that is, uh, uh, um, uh, I think, a second issue. So, so the issue of the reforms is, uh, uh, could be debated more. I, I stop here, of course, because my time is over. But I think the reform policies in Germany, directly and indirectly, by uh, affecting expectations uh, and put pressure on, on, on all partners in society, have been important. So I would argue just recommending the German model to France or uh, Spain or Italy by saying the unions have to be more constructive uh, is, is, I think, not uh, an export uh, good we, which will be successful. That would be my prediction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Klaus. Let, let me give a chance to the panelists to, to react to uh, what we've heard before I turn to the floor. If you want to, if there is anything you want to say? No? No? Let's go into questions. OK, good. So let's go to the questions. Uh, let's, uh, let's open the discussion. Um, I will take the questions uh, three by three, um, and uh, starting with Richard Portes. And please introduce yourself, nevertheless. A question for Erica. Um, you uh, referred to, you, you scraped over very quickly mm -hmm. the question of scrape data. Yes. And uh, I'm a little bit familiar with the Billion Prices Project, mm -hmm. which seems to be a rather impressive yes. uh, effort. And I'd be interested in your comments. I mean, you said not mm -hmm. free, riskless, or clean, yes. I think. Um, well, yes, but OK. I mean, maybe you can um, give us a little more detail on on the comparison between that and US CP, CPI data and mm -hmm. 
because it, there are periods, if you look at the, at the indices, um, there are periods in which there is significant divergence, mm -hmm. uh, but over time, they catch, one, one catches up with the other. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and do those diff periods of difference tell us anything? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Richard. Uh, maybe one additional question to Erica, if I may, uh, when it comes to web scraping and, and big data generally, mm -hmm. uh, is about uh, representativeness of the, of the samples. Because there, there might be an illusion that when you have very big data, it has to be representative. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like in this uh, Jorge Luis Borges story where the ultimate map is the country itself, right? So if you get all data, it's representative. But big data is also subject to sample bias, uh, adverse selection, and the like. So I would like to, to know more about it. Mm -hmm. uh, Luigi Zingales. Uh, yeah, Luigi Zingales from Chicago. This is a question mostly for Tommaso. In fact, is, is a point because I'm sure you, you know that. But you dismiss... Uh, like a, a joke, the tension between macroeconomists and I.O. Macroeconomists say, no problem because prices are too low, they, they don't rise, and then the problem of I.O. economists has been solved. Now, as you know, and then you pointed out in your data, uh, I.O. economists are concerned about margins, not about price levels. Macroeconomists are concerned about price levels. Why do I say that? Because I've seen people dismissing, for example, concern about the telecommunication industry in the United States. Because if you graph uh, the prices, the price has been going down, and concentration has been going up, so say there is no problem. Uh, reality, if you look at how much prices drop, they drop much more slowly than in other countries, and I think that's the reason the concentration generated that. But then there is an other interesting question, it is more for the macroeconomists and actually for the ECB, the central bankers, is we know that uh, the reaction to price increase and decrease is very different. So if you look at gasoline, whenever there is a price drop of gasoline, uh, the gasoline pumps are less prompt in rebating it, price increase is more. So to what extent the inflation targets impacts actually the IO of pricing of companies to the point that favors tacit collusion in a moment in which you have reduction in cost due to innovation, and then the fact that the low inflation targets allow uh, firms to keep prices constant in face of dropping cost, and so favors collusion. Thank you, Luigi. Let me take a third question um, here, please. And sorry if I can't identify you, but you're oh. just too far away. No Central problem. bankers only have a uh, medium-term horizon, as you know. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> We're not that far-sighted. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Central banker is here. I'm Oscar Arte from, from Bank of Spain. My question is to, to Tommaso as well. Um, and it's in, in connection with the, the relation that you established between markups and uh, the pass-through of, of monetary policy. You essentially said that uh, at some point that uh, the fact that uh, uh, markups are now higher may imply that the pass-through of, uh, of monetary policy may be, may be lower. I, I, I must say that I found the, the argument a little bit uh, unclear. For In principle, you may have a, a high level of, of markups, but these markups are still being very responsive to, to, to some shocks, including possibly to, to monetary policy shocks. So my, my first question is, is a clarifying one. I wonder whether you can elaborate a little bit more on, on this, because it may be an important issue for central bankers, given the evolution that you show us about, uh, about markups. Now, uh, I, I think that there is another channel that, uh, that may affect the pass-through of monetary policy and the effectiveness of the, of the measures deployed by, by central bankers these days, which is the one linking uh, higher markups, profits, retain profits, and the financing of, of investment by, by non-financial uh, corporates. Now, uh, what we have seen over the crisis is that uh, in some cases, this was true in the US, markups ha have been strongly countercyclical. And in the euro area, markups were countercyclical precisely, or more countercyclical precisely in those countries that were more severely hit by the financial crisis. Actually, in countries like Spain, Portugal, or, or Ireland, markups went up in the worst part of the, of the crisis. And, and, and some of my colleagues have documented that this, uh, this uh, uh, phenomenon was particularly intense in those firms that were more financially constrained. So what we are seeing these days is that markups are going up, that firms are able to finance an increasing part of their financing needs through uh, retained profits. Um, my, my impression is that this may uh, eventually uh, erode the effectiveness of, of, of monetary policy. Think about, uh, for instance, German firms. German firms have been recording a substantially positive 
uh, net financing capacity. They are net lenders to the rest of the, of, the, of the system in a relatively large amount. And we have seen this before in, in countries like Japan, and we are seeing this in countries like, uh, like Spain these days uh, as well. So essentially this is telling us that firms are not investing much given uh, 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 very, very loose financing conditions. They are peeling up a lot of cash. So in this context, perhaps uh, we should expect that the small changes in the interest rates uh, engineered by central bankers perhaps are not going to have a big effect. But I would certainly like to know your views about this, about this issue. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let me turn back to, to Erica and Tommaso. Let me remind you that there is a trade-off between the length of the questions and the number of questions. That's okay. <laughs> for, for the next ones. Uh, Erica, please. Okay, so, uh, so that's a really interesting question, the comparison between the CPI and the Billion Prices Project. Um, uh, th there are two, thing, uh, two general points that I can elaborate on. The first of all, that um, official statistics are transparent in a way that will always be inconsistent with protecting profit-making intellectual property. Also to come. So there, there, uh, a billion prices project, as, um, as good as it is, um, will always have some proprietary methods that, uh, that you will never be able to examine and know because they have to protect their secret sauce. Um, the second thing is that there are data limitations from web scraping that, uh, that billion prices solves by relying on official statistics. So they use the Consumer Expenditure Survey for their weighting. They use CPI numbers for all of the products and services that are not uh, posted on the web, right? Uh, and they use the CPI for validation and for benchmarking. So they are very much an extrapolation, interpolation in some ways, of the official CPI. A complement to it, useful. Uh, they put out uh, some, tail some products that are tailored to special needs that, uh, that people are willing to pay for, but they are not a substitute for the CPI. Um, and now, in terms of web scraping in general, well, it depends on what you scrape and what you scrape for. The uh, CPI program does use web scraping for actually for its uh, for many of its hedonic models now because that's the cheapest way to download information on product characteristics these days, and so that's that's very useful. It is experimenting and thinking about how to, uh, to scrape uh, prices on an ongoing basis. But the problem with that is um, that twofold. One is uh, informed consent issues. Right now, if you participate in a survey, you know you participate in a survey and you have promises from the BLS on how that information will be treated. The legal issues for consent for web scraped information haven't been worked out. And I'll tell you confidentially, uh, Census and BLS have different advice from lawyers on, on this, so it, it hasn't been worked out. Um, and along with that is that uh, there are high fixed costs to setting up a statistical process to produce dependable data. If you build your process around something that might disappear that you have no control over, then, then all of a sudden you may not be able to produce data of reliable quality when that happens. So, uh, so there's some, some big barriers. Generally, I see the, uh, these big data projects as useful uh, for the statistical system and obviously for the people who pay for those products, but they are a complement, not a substitute for official statistics. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Um, when you are a com an official of the commission, you develop a skill in deflecting uh, uh, the question that you answer on a slightly tangential way, so uh, you, I'll try you, this skill if I have acquired you, it. You'll never be as good as central bankers. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Luigi, yes, absolutely. Um, but but I was thinking of the trends, so I'm, I wasn't comparing levels, so trends are common, some trends are common across the US and Europe. Uh, the fact that some, some, some prices are higher in the US, I do agree. I'm really worried when the 
when the head of the um, antitrust division of the Department of Justice is saying that there is no evidence that a fourth mobile firm in markets reduces prices, so anticipating that the next merger wave will be approved. Luckily, in Europe, I think we are slightly more independent, maybe by design, because we oversee 28, well, soon 27 different countries, so the system of revolving doors is not the same as there. So, but I would be more concerned with, for, about your bill than, than uh, your, 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 your bundle in the US. Um, expectation about inflation. So I do observe a lot, especially in so-called declining industries, or these basic stuff. So for instance, recently we had a merger among Tau producers. It's a disgusting product. Tau is the thing you made the, the cigarette filter with. And cigarettes are declining because uh, worldwide, apart from a few countries, going down. And so they said, you should allow us to merge from, from t three to two because we'll be able to rationalize capacity. And we said, this is not the right counterfactual. So if sure, you will have to rationalize capacity anyway. But, but, but uh, sure. if we want to increase prices of cigarettes for health reasons, we have different tools. And the, the merger was actually blocked. So, but we, we, we see a lot of, the, of this uh, that, that sort of um, implicit collusion going on, especially in declining industries of, of homogenous goods. On, um, on the question deflection, I guess, um, the, um, my, the purpose of, of what I said was to throw some ideas into the modeling of, uh, of macroeconomists. As I said, most likely you are already doing it. If you don't, perhaps think about it. Um, to, 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 um, to clarify, the, the, the link is not between margins and pass-through, but between, between concentration and pass-through. If, if concentration increases, pass-through are predicted to go down. But if concentration increases, also margins. So indirectly, there is also this kind of corre corre correlation. What is interesting for me, since I am on the anti side, is to see the effect to which monetary policy, what you do, affects what I'm doing. So since I'm observing an unprecedented, at least in the in last 20 years, um, wave of M&As, of mergers and acquisition, I wonder whether the monetary policy, to the extent that it, it, keeps, it gives a cheap credit to firms, especially to very large firms, these firms want to acquire other firms instead of doing organic growth, which is what we would prefer from a competi competition point of view, question mark. Uh, if I, would be, uh, I would like to hear your views, in fact. And, um, and also another mechanism I'd be interested in, uh, again, if you provide cheap credit, you may actually uh, induce less of this industry shake out that we had in the past. So in Europe, did we keep too many inefficient firms alive? Uh, I don't have an answer to that, but uh, I would like to know to what extent monetary policy can, can affect that. Thank you. Let me take another round of questions. So we had John Milborough. Uh, Thanks. Uh, John Milborough. Um, Tomas uh, Valetti made some very interesting points, and it, th they link with the discussion this morning from, from Aviv Nebo on, on concentration. Um, I think you said, Tomaso, that um, you assumed that macroeconomists would have taken concentration into account in their inflation models. Um, well, actually, I think um, that would be the wrong assumption. Um, I think part of the reason why they haven't is because they've been focused on uh, inflation models where the price level doesn't matter. And of course, concentration and markups affect relative prices. So if we think about inflation as partly a process of relative price adjustment, then concentration and markups become an important part of the dynamics. Um, and the work that you're doing at the, at the Commission in, in terms of providing data on concentration at the national level going back 25 years, I think that's going to be really valuable in, in improving um, inflation models. And the Groulon paper that you cited um, for the US for the first time gives us a comprehensive um, Herfindahl index going back to 1970 or 72. Um, and actually, um, Janine, Aaron, and I um, have been modeling US inflation, and it turns out this is actually a, a useful part of the, of the model. Um, so it affects relative prices. So union density, um, so worker power and firm power, are a part of the process of relative price determination, and that in turn affects inflation dynamics. Thank you. Uh, Sebnem, Karim Sioskan. And then we'll have Charles Wiploch, and there will be a last round of questions. Okay, Don't Shabnam, worry. 
Shebnam Kalem Nolskian from University of Maryland. My question is uh, for Tommaso. Um, I want to um, compare, well, I want to ask you in terms of the work you are doing for Europe, uh, how it is different than the US, because I want to compare US and Europe in this whole markup business. What we know by now is the, the markup increase in US is driven by large firms. In fact, if you look at the census firms, you don't, you don't find much. And the new work done at the fund for European firms pretty much coming with the same conclusion. Last year in Sintra, we also see the differences between Europe and, and US. Okay, this says if it is about large firms, we should be thinking about antitrust and mergers and acquisitions and all those things. Now, coming back to Europe, part of that is also integration within Europe, right? Like the foreign mergers and acquisitions across the border. And that's something that is desirable and wanted and you know, uh, supported by the policy since the introduction of Euro, because that's going to bring risk sharing, equity financing, and all that. So my question is, with this work you are doing, you know, looking at the increase in markups, large firms, all firms, what, did, did you see any role for foreign firms you know, when we have more you know, foreign acquisitions across the border, Germany and France, if that like top four firms driving the ratios are they all foreign? And what will be the implications for that? Because that's something I believe we want in European Union. Okay, Charles? Uh, I just wanted to, to, to react to, to John Mulbauer. Uh, I, I don't understand the reasoning that we, when we think about inflation, we should care about relative prices or market or all of that. Uh, if, they have, if these things change, they change once, and the change can last for two years, five years, ten years. But you cannot Im imagine that markups keep going up or keep going down because they would hit the, the limit. You cannot think that concentration will keep moving in such large amounts. So at the end, these are temporary effects. And the central banks that care about the medium run uh, are very unlikely to see any impact uh, of these things. And I'm afraid there is a lot of confusion building up, or unless maybe I am confused, but uh, I think this is something, and I think Ricardo Reis, uh, raised the same issue earlier on. So we spend enormous amount of time discussing these things, but at the end of the day, the impact of inflation may be beyond uh, two, three, four, five years is likely to be ne negligible. So to put it differently, that, does any of what we've been discussing over these two days matter for monetary policy? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let's back, have a poll. Back to the, <laughs> back to the panel. <laughs> That's the poll for today. Tomaso, you want to start? Yeah, so um, thank you, John. Thank you for, for, well, for this comment. I think yeah, sure. uh, no matter what your, your, your opinions are, it's great that we're discussing about it. So, having, so it's true also, also before somebody said we're typically not invited in this kind of fora. I think it, I mean, it's excellent that the ECB in the past, yeah. um, it's collecting data. Uh, I know there is a, 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 an, an effort done by ECB to collect concentration indices. And the fact that we are here together is, can, can just be a positive thing. Um, the, what we're doing in particular, the commission is, is twofold. We, we are gathering information about uh, uh, firms in plausible antitrust markets because for me the market definition is, is an important exercise. So where products compete, so it's not so three-digit level industry would be to, to aggregate for me. So we are doing something to do a market reconstruction exercise, which is not an obvious one. And uh, and then we are doing also a collection or a systematic collection on the on the margins of the firms that we observe, which is a very selected sample because obviously the, the commission is looking at super large kind of kind of mergers. So buy a Monsanto a hundred billion dollars. This is not the, the average firm, but we do observe that margin for those large firms uh, is, uh, is on the rise historically. We know less about the, the smaller firms. Erica? Yeah, I would say also that uh, the theoretical foundations of many of our models assume a market structure that's, that's more or less competitive. And if we are going to a world where that's not uh, generally the case, then we should expect some changes in the behavior of, uh, uh, of variables that we, that we care about because we have actors who are now no longer in a competitive market. And so I think knowing what's going on in, the, in how markets operate has got to be very important for conducting monetary policy because it gives you an idea of where to look and what sort of relationships might be changing. Thank you. Klaus? Yeah, just coming back, Charles, to your 
question, uh, what can we say from what we are discussing? So one example is minimum wages, uh, where I think uh, uh, the long-term effects are very important also for pricing. Because as in Germany, we had no minimum wages because the trade unions for many years didn't want minimum wages because they were controlling the wages anyway. Now, since they no longer can, can, it, can, can control it, uh, that's why they've start, I was in meetings where the trade unions said, we need the minimum wage now because we have no other way to influence wages. And this is not only for the poor, it's also for everybody because if you, if you push uh, wages, minimum wages high, then all the upper wages also hopefully move up. So it's about a long-term strategy to move up wages. Uh, you may be in favor of it, against it. I'm not judging this at the moment. I'm just saying. So now the commission in Germany uh, we have is, uh, is making proposals every so, so to speak years or so uh, to increase the minimum wage. And by that lead uh, the debate about how the wage uh, structure should, should develop. So that's, that's something that at least has to be observed by, by central banks, I would argue. Okay. Um, yeah, I, one, of, one of the interesting arguments made is that if you let the minimum wage sink low enough, then it can become a tool of, uh, uh, of employers. It becomes essentially a monopsonistic tool. They can all set their, implicitly or explicitly, decide to set their wages to it. And then um, uh, yeah, it becomes a way of collusion uh, 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 providing a, a method for collusion when there isn't an obvious other mechanism for it. And in that case, then raising the minimum wage, you could get actually increase in wages and increase in employment at the same time. And if you didn't understand that as being a part of a labor market, you could be quite confused by watching wages go up and employment go up at the same time. Thank you, Philip. Yeah, maybe in line to what you say, for example, in Europe, in UK, you see that the, the wage profile in the decile is held down by minimum wage because basically employers use minimum wage to pay the minimum they can. So you, the, the curve of the, of the, of the median, is the distribution of wage distribution in the UK is like this, you know? Mm -hmm. So this is a tool that can be in double effect positive or negative for workers? So let me take a last round of questions. I already have three questions, so let's, let's consider the, the list is closed. So starting with Ricardo. Ricardo Reyes. Sorry. So with the start of the, of the banking and monetary union in Europe, what we observed was an enormously large capital flows from the core to the periphery. And in, this is in between 2000 and 2005 and 6. And what we observed as well, which was, I think, quite surprising, was that this coincided then with a complete stagnation of productivity in Portugal, Greece, Ireland, and many countries. And that has led many macroeconomists who have used I.O. tools and said that a, there was an enormous amount of misallocation of these very large capital flows from the core to the periphery. And to see in that a beginning of where the euro crisis started and many of the problems that then are still afflicting us and led to some of the discussions earlier. Now, a difficult, and so Shebnam, for instance, has worked quite a bit of this, and so have I. Um, a difficulty that we've had in macro, and so for the I.O. economists exactly, and where could you help us, is while we observe the markups, we observe the concentration, we've gone and measured, we've used the I.O. tools, but well, we have difficulties understanding what's the source of misallocation. Uh, from the perspective of capital, not from the perspective of market power, but from capital. Is it that financial systems in Portugal or Greece weren't mature enough to allocate this enormous influx of capital that came from the core? Is it that banks weren't sufficiently regulated or benefited from too low interest rates or lax monetary policy? Is it that governments intervened to protect some sectors and some companies and some incumbents that were powerful? Or is it that antitrust, uh, antitrust authorities didn't do their job or not? To what way can you enlighten us in this debate and use maybe the I.O. tools, i.e. linking the macro capital flows to the, uh, to the misallocations as opposed to the more micro concentration approach that, say, Luigi or you were mentioning earlier? Okay, one question here. Yeah. Yeah, Nick, to uh, University College London. I just wanted to pick up on the point that Charles made. Uh, I agree that if this is temporary, the increase in the, in the markups, then it shouldn't matter too much for monetary policy. The issues or the facts are that, you know, it has been going on for 40 years. And the increase in the markups are by about 40 to 50 percentage points. So we're going from 1.2 markup to 1.6, 1.7. Um, and it's not just that we see it there. So that's, a, that's 1% a year in, on additional inflation. 
transportation, if you want, if, if that would be the, the uh, economy aggregate. But we see it in the decline in the labor share, which is consistent with that, because it's basically the reverse of, of the same effect. And we see it also, something that hasn't been talked about much in terms of firm profits. In the US, firm profits, at least for the publicly traded firms, has gone from 1% of sales to 8% of sales over that same period. Now, again, that's consistent with this increase in uh, uh, market power, but the point I'm trying to make is that this is not something that's just very short, okay? This has been going on for 40 years, and the pickup has been going on until now. In fact, for the last six, seven years, the increase have, has been uh, the most steep. And then the last point is, it's the same story in, in Europe, at least we look at the publicly traded firms in, in response to Shesner's point. The European firms have the same uh, story. There's an increase of about 40 points in, in markups and also in, in profits. Thank you. Can you pass the mic to Michael for the last question? Okay, so I have a really quick question for Erica. I'm fascinated by first degree price discrimination that's becoming sort of rampant in, on the internet. And uh, whenever I go on to Expedia, I have my wife do it at the same time so we can see we get the same price offer. Mm -hmm. So how does, this, how does the BLS even dream of tracking that? I mean, the, uh, <laughs> this could be changing over time. I mean, I think uh, these firms are getting more and more important and I think Amazon is probably also practicing some type of first degree price discrimination. They know my credit card, they know how much money I make in print or how much I spend. Um, how do you deal with that? So I actually, I, I actually don't know that in particular. I mean, I know how they price, uh, I actually watch them price uh, utility costs and, uh, and telephone services using the internet. And in that case, they signed on as if they were a customer and put in their request and saw what the price would be. So I assume that that's what's going on as well. So whatever those cookies are reading these characteristics as uh, is probably getting the price. But I don't know that anybody's looked at it. And I would think that that would be quite an interesting uh, project. Yeah, Very quickly, on, actually, on first degree price discrimination, to the extent that it exists, I just want to make the abstract but, but, but interesting point that pricing would be based on willingness to pay. So just on demand side consideration and costs are completely disconnected. So monetary policy is lost forever in, the, in that kind of world because the prices don't react to cost, which is just, again, before lunch, food, food for thought is always interesting. Uh, and and uh, to Ricardo, um, again, we can continue this discussion, obviously. Uh, but in terms of misallocation, one, I've already said, to the extent that investors follow profits and they want to make money, uh, instead of organic growth, where you have to compete against someone else, uh, you're just going to acquire uh, companies. There is evidence of these uh, mergers which are killing some particular companies. So uh, they, they all, especially in the, in the, in the biopharma industry, the old uh, adagio was uh, uh, the, sh the small guys should be bought by the large guys because they don't have enough capital and the it's going to be supplied by the large guys. In the data, we observe that's true to the extent that they are not competing against each other. So the research projects are completely disconnected. If instead the research projects are very close to each other, as you might expect from another point of view, the small guys are being bought and then the project is discontinued, which produces a, a, a misallocation. Another misallocation could be in terms of inputs. I said think of the, of the vertical structure. Market power is on the input, so there may be the, the wrong choice of the inputs that then uh, it also uh, trickles down to, to, to final prices. We have a, a consumer surplus uh, benchmark in our merger analysis, but I can see some of this mechanism. But uh, again, thanks a lot for your observations. Just one note of caution, Tommaso. Monetary policy is not, is not only, even not, even not primarily, I would say, acting on cost. It's about acting on aggregate demand, right? <laughs> so just one note of hope for, for, for us. Absolutely. Um, Thank you for Klaus, Philippe, one last word. You mean? One word of conclusion. One, one yeah. conclusion. Well, um, yeah, uh, inequality was an issue which we uh, have also covered, uh, which is uh, relevant. I think that uh, what we have seen in many countries, including Germany, is that the wider spread uh, in the wages um, is not necessarily uh, an inequality issue, uh, because we have to conceive this in, in, in the context of households uh, and of, of income households in total have. That's one important aspect, and also what I mean, Michael already mentioned, uh, that, and also uh, uh, Uta Schoenberg, that, um, that uh, if uh, low-skilled people get a job, um, they have low, low wages. And this doesn't mean that 
it's not worth that they can get these jobs. I think that's very relevant to understand. Mm -hmm. Philip? Well, I think one of the things that we didn't touch so much that is important with inequality is inequality between groups, women, men, migrant, national. And I think this is an important dim dimension in terms of policy response. In the, we, our next global wage report will be exactly about decomposing uh, gender inequality in terms of wages. That they, and for example, in the last report, it's interesting to see that uh, the, the general gender gap controlling by the characteristic of women and job is around 20% in Europe. In the first top 1%, it is 45, 45% or 47%. Thank you for this last remark. Thank you very much to the panelists. This was a fascinating discussion. I guess the only conclusion is that uh, it's about the beauty of general equilibrium, no? that we t it takes labor economists and uh, competition and IO economists to uh, say something meaning meaningful on prices. So that's the conclusion. <laughs> Thank you very much.